All right, we're back, and we've made it to almost 20 episodes. We're on 18 now, and I've got back a long-lost friend. We've got Craig with us. (laughs) I'm alive. Indeed, indeed. (laughs) Barely, I believe Steve is still handling the last of his tests, so he may or may not join us. We'll see. But anyway, we were already talking about uh, something at the very beginning of this. Yeah. So we'll just kind of jump right back in and uh, talk about the... The second most talked about topic of the moment, uh, COVID. <laughs> yeah, that that uh that thing nobody cares about. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, we got the um, the FDA's uh, emergency use emergency use authorization, um, so EUA for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So it's uh, one of the two mRNA vaccines that are out there right now. That be messenger RNA. Um, so messenger RNA is the RNA that, uh, no, it's not just like transcription RNA, which is used to produce proteins and whatnot. mRNA is the kind of RNA that will float around your bloodstream endogenously, so naturally uh, as well. Um, in fact, when that goes wrong, it causes certain diseases. So if you remember mad cow disease or was a crutchfeld Jacobs disease, uh, when was what happens in humans. When they talked about prions or prions, those are bits of mRNA. Oh, really? So it's it is it is normal for that stuff to exist in your body. I was Out, not it's extracellular I and intracellular. Were. I'm actually kind of familiar with the whole mad cow thing. I did a lot of studying on that yeah. back when it was uh, really blowing up. So yeah, so prions so prion, are based. If you have any of yeah. that information, is just some stray mRNA. Yeah, basically. So when it when it misfolds and does what not what it's supposed to in the body, it causes prion disease. Uh, or and if it happens, like say in the brain or whatever, that's Mad Cow or Crutchfield Jacobs. Hmm. Fascinating. So, yeah. So mRNA is is a thing that your body utilizes intracellularly and extracellularly normally. So that is that is just a general thing that your body will use anyway. The big advantage of using mRNA for vaccination is that you can only you can produce specifically the thing that will piss off your immune system and not the rest of the virus in your body, and your body produces the vaccine by itself. So that's good and bad. Uh, it's bad if it overdoes it. It's good if it does it just enough. It's bad if it underdoes it. So, you know, it, it'll, it'll, uh, there's, there's kind of shades of gray there that you're, you're looking at. Now, are these the vaccines that we're hearing the uh, horror stories about, or is this another? Because I know the uh, the ones in England apparently there have been <clears throat> some issues. Um, uh, what was, what was so so that's actually so here's one of the things, and, and we were just talking about this in terms of the timing. Uh, we can jump right into that part too. And so, um, a, a person uh, close enough to the to you know say friends or family inclusive here, um, basically that you know as a policy, so the the vaccines, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccines are being shipped now. Uh, they'll arrive shortly at hospitals uh, so that they can start vaccinating people yeah, ASAP. Early is tomorrow, um, from what I understand. And and the uh, the the other the the secondary link there and the chain of people I told you about for that relationship uh, is going to get vaccinated. I think like tomorrow or the next day. Uh, but as a response to some of the the cockups that have been going on, this is one of the things that was specifically referenced. Uh, the 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 amount of time that these multi-dose vials the vaccine arrives in, the amount of time that they're supposedly viable, to my knowledge before, was around five days. Uh, that has been cut down to six hours. So once they pull out a multi-dose vial, six hours later, the vial is done. Now, with the demand that's going to be present, I don't see any trouble with them addressing that by just emptying the vial into patients. It's very straightforward. You're gonna have, I think, uh, that person's in charge of like 100,000 uh, personnel. Um, so that's on the order of, that that is gonna very easily go through the supply that is delivered first day. So the uh, people who are gonna be doing rounds with COVID patients, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the other relationship involved in the people I told you about. That's that's one of the people that's gonna be out there doing stuff like that. Sure. Um, so that when they're out there taking care of these people, you want them vaccinated kind of as soon as possible. Uh, dosing schedule that I was informed about was uh, dose one, 21 days, dose two, seven to 14 days, and you're at optimum immunity. 
so that's it's always going to be a two dose schedule of these mRNA vaccines. Uh, that's that's what seemed to work best. Um, and I, so I mentioned there's the EUA. Well, with the EUA prior to that, the advisory uh, panel for the FDA met and they went over the data that was provided by Pfizer and BioNTech uh, in a meeting briefing, uh, which is of the, the two links that you see in that, that Twitter thread I posted for you. Mm -hmm. um, the second link, I believe it is, is the, the uh, meeting briefing. Yeah, see that here. So that has data in it, which is, which is very useful to look through. Um, so that's, that's finally got the good data in it that I was waiting for before recommending or not recommending like getting vaccinated. Uh, let alone whether or not I was going to do it. Uh, and basically from what it looks like um, in the data, I'm going to get vaccinated at first opportunity, which is probably going to be the same time most other people are going to be able to. Uh, some, you know, sometime around end of first quarter, uh, early second quarter of next year. So kind of uh, maybe a hair earlier than I predicted back in, what was it, March or February, when, I was, when people started talking about vaccines, uh, well, March or April. Uh, I said it's going to be at least a year, um, you know, uh, 12 to 18 months. And it looks like uh, we're going to land somewhere around there. I said early summer, and that's we might be able to get to uh, late spring, early summer uh, instead of just early summer. Mm -hmm. Now, I would expect that the vaccination in the so the approach to herd immunity is probably going to take us through September of next year. So not quite this time next year, but a little bit earlier, it's probably going to be roughly when we hit herd immunity with everyone vaccinated and immune. Because um, remember, I said dose one, 21 days, dose two, seven to 14 days. So you're looking at uh, a month and a half there before you're, you're immune after dose one. Um, so you take that, you add in the amount of time it's going to take to distribute to the population and get them vaccinated and you know get them that whole ball rolling. And my guess is that's going to be through the summer. So, you know, there's a little bit of a delay there. Now, do you know on that uh, what sort of vaccin not vaccination, what sort of um, uh, immunity is conferred by just the initial dose? Is it like a, you have to have both of them so to really get that's the actually effect? interesting. That is in the PDF, the, um, the second PDF there. So the first PDF, when I'm talking about these two, the first one's the EUA letter from the FDA that just says, hey, Pfizer, you get to do this. The second one is the actual meeting briefing document, and that's the one that uh, gives the, the data that we can look at. So I don't remember what page it's on in the PDF. Let me just scroll down here. There's a plot I can just show you. Yeah, there it is. So in the document, it says, okay, so it is, is good. The, the PDF and the document numbers do line up. So page 30, you can see there are two lines on a plot. Okay. And basically by 14 days after dose one, Oh, pretty good immunity to uh, build up this level of immunity. Okay, I, I see here. Yeah, but so the but it is a two dose. So this is this is a, a dose one um, efficacy, and this is like people who got in in the test population who got infected post dose one placebo and vaccine, and you can see that after about fourteen days, huge difference between them. One just goes flat, and the other one continues going up at the same angle. Interesting. Okay. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, I think I was reading those the wrong way, like backwards. Oh, oh. yeah, I was. P placebo versus yeah. Yeah, it'd be really bad like, if wait, the what, vaccine what made is, it worse. Why do these numbers not? Oh, it doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so this is. So, so you can see basically one of them just flat lines. That's the vaccine. Yeah. So uh, this is this is a 30 microgram uh, inoculation. So this, which is significant, um, but that that's this is the tip. Of, this is the dose one schedule that you would get as a as a patient right now, or as as a person going in to get vaccinated right now. This is the same dosing uh, that they'll be delivering. That's what you're seeing on a, on paper right there. So this is after dose one. After two weeks or so, you see there's just a a big change in the curve. It goes from the same as the placebo group. To being completely divergent, um, it's a two dose schedule though. The do dose two comes in about 21 days. So um, if you look at 21 days there, and you, you see the change, there's hardly any change in the slope. That's actually kind of a good thing. Your body's or the body is not. Um, it doesn't appear there's like a major enhancement, and there's also definitely not like a breakdown in immunity. Your body doesn't just kind of give up and say fuck it. So. 
overall, this is good info. Um, now, there are adverse events, um, of course. So this, this includes things beyond side effects, just to be clear. This includes all general population events as well. And so that's one of the things you need to look at when you're looking at these adverse events is how often do these things that have happened to your test population, how often do these things happen in the general population? Is there a difference between the test population and the general population? And then is there a difference between the placebo group and the medicated group? Now that being and said, it looks, we should probably it, go over some of those because there's some scary sure. shit in there. Well, so so yeah, and that's the thing is, and I can tell you right now without going through most most of the stuff just off the bat here, the vaccine reaction is not very severe, and the bad things that did happen in the populations that were tested happen at the same rate in the general population. So overall. It looks like the vaccine does what it's supposed to, which is basically piss off your body into va into defending itself, but it doesn't do really anything beyond that. So the major difference between populations here, between the test and between the uh, the vaccine and placebo populations, is that the vaccine is doing its job, and then the major po then there's not really any difference between the test population and general population for other adverse events. So if you scroll down to page 33, this is the beginning of the overview for adverse events. And uh, this is uh, a pretty illustrative uh, table here, table 14. So this will tell you kind of, uh, you know, when they solicit uh, the patient, did anything bad happen? Do you feel bad? How are you feeling today? Versus the patient just showing up and saying, doctor, I feel awful. Um, and then you can see how many people withdrew from the studies due to adverse events. You can see that uh, SAE is serious adverse events. Uh, and if you look at these numbers here, so they had test populations of uh, 21,621 for the vaccine, and then 21,631, so 10 more people for the placebo. So about even populations. And if you look at, uh, at the bottom from, uh, of the table, it says from dose one to cutoff date, all enrolled. So not just the safety population, but everybody who was enrolled. Um, comparable for re the uh, withdrawals due to an adverse event. If you look at the serious adverse events, comparable. And then deaths, which you would expect in a population this large, just to be clear. Deaths, uh, comparable as well. So two deaths in the, um, and this, these were natural events. Um, so it had nothing to do with vaccines on both sides of this here, placebo and vaccine. There are two deaths in the vaccine group, and there are four deaths in the placebo group. Uh, so those those people had issues. Um, the serious adverse events, those are again pretty much explainable with uh, they're consistent with general population statistics. And you know, they actually go through these later on, so it's not just me saying it up here. Uh, the withdrawals, they don't really. I know they go into details about the withdrawals, but I didn't read really uh, too much into that. So we can actually go through that later on. Now, if you look at the top, towards the top of the table here, um, immediate unsolicited adverse event within 30 minutes of vaccination. Hardly anybody. And so that, that can be anything from, doctor, my shoulder hurts a little bit. You know, like maybe the guy injected it wrong or, or pushed a little hard with a needle. Sure. It can be anything from that to like, doctor, I have a splitting headache and I feel like I'm going to puke my guts out. Hmm. So now... I would probably suggest, I would posit that that would be a serious adverse event, not just an adverse event. And there's that they make that distinction clearly, uh, they clearly make that distinction throughout the document. So when they just say unsolicited adverse event, my guess here is that they didn't have a serious adverse event within the first three minutes. Uh, otherwise, they would report it separately. Uh, injection site reactions, um, pretty much uh, consistent numbers here. You have more people who are going to, uh, so when they have N out of N here, you can see that the number of people who had an injection site reaction uh, when solicited uh, is, is different from the total number of people who were injected. So you went from like 18,000, 19,000 or so down to like 4,000. So they only solicited, um, ever, they only requested info from certain numbers of people. So of the people who had a request made of them, does the injection site bother you within seven days? Um, about three quarters of people who were asked who were vaccinated said it bothers them. Um, and about an eighth of people who were given a placebo said it bothered them. 
And this is and this is consistent between dose one and dose two. So basically, you'll probably feel a little bit annoyed at the uh, injection site. Yeah, I'm noticing. <clears throat> I'm noticing fatigue is fairly common as well. Oh, uh, you so you're, you're yeah, you've gone down a little bit. Yeah, so actually, we can skip down to um, I mean the, table seventeen. I mean, it's kind of a given that if you get an injection somewhere of something that's meant to provoke your body yeah. into a response, you're going to have some kind of local reaction. So, the typical thing here is what what generally happens is your body will produce a whole bunch of interferon. Um, so you might remember from back in the early days when everyone was taking was uh, freaking about about HIV and antiretrovirals, interferon was a big thing people talked about. But, your body produces that on its own, and it's in response to a viral um, a viral infection. So um, your interferon is going to cause things like joint aches, muscle aches, uh, fever, and fatigue and headache. Like most, basically all the stuff that's listed in this table is entirely due to interferon showing up or an infection. Well, what did you say? Since Beg pardon. The chills as well, since I see that's actually yeah. Surprisingly, that's very common on the second dose. Yeah, so your body warms up, and then you know you're you're kind of freaking out internally with your uh, your uh, internal your um, regulatory chemistry. So it's it's a normal thing. Vomiting and diarrhea, I wouldn't expect as much. The diarrhea, yeah, kind of, but vomiting, you shouldn't really feel too much nausea. What's up, yeah, boys? See ya. Oh, hey, Steve. Steve. I, I did. I had no idea you guys were starting. I, I still have a <laughs> I still have fantastic nuclear coating that I have to do. Ah, it's uh okay. it's a blast. So so I have a uh, I I have to get good on this in order to get my A because I did uh, terrible on the final exam. It was fantastic. God damn it. Well, good luck then. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, uh, just going over the. Sound. Um, so I, I uh, posted the, uh, that thread there in the uh, in the show ideas, and um, that I just when I, I had a thread, I I blurted it out when I got to read through the uh, the EUA and the um, the advisory panel briefing notes from mm. uh, from Pfizer. Uh, so we're just going through some of that data now. It's just scrolling through and and covering some of it. So yeah. basically, like uh, actually, so if we scroll back up, um, Evan, if we scroll back up to page thirty three. Mm -hmm. Um. So the the uh, from dose one through uh, one month after dose two. So basically, from beginning to a month after the second one's given, the unsolicited, non-serious adverse events. This one is basically going to give you an idea of roughly how many people are, because this is the whole safety population, if you will. Uh, this will give you an idea of how many people are are probably going to experience some kind of side effect, either from the kind of psychosomatic effect of of getting the shot, or from the actual vaccination. So if you look at unsolicited, non-serious adverse events, you'll see 27% in the vaccinated population and 12.5% in the placebo population. So that should tell you that there is a a a significant number of patients that are going to have a side effect that is truly due to the vaccine. And that there is also still going to be a significant population of people who would have had an effect anyway. So the question really is, how do you segregate those two? Well, we can explain a lot of these kinds of side effects from the uh, triggered mechanisms that cause the immunity. So we we're just talking about interferon being released. That's a good example. Uh, so then if you scroll down and you look at, you know, all these different things that come out of this, you can see there's the, um, the vaccine and the placebo for dose one and dose two. And you can see that the discrepancy in the percentages there. So fatigue and then you have headache and you just basically you want to look at the difference in the, uh, the percentage of the population that had these different effects. And you can get an, uh, a rough idea for how much that's going to be due to the fact that you were given a shot and told it's a vaccine versus the vaccine actually doing something. So if you just kind of eliminate the the percentage that's due to the placebo, you see that there's this gap there, and you can just kind of assume that that's roughly. This is a terrible approximation, by the way. You can assume that's roughly the uh, the percent chance you're going to have of getting that uh, adverse event or side effect. More importantly, getting a side effect and it being due to the fact that you actually got the vaccine. But again, 
horrible approximation. The further away you get from zero on both of those percentages, the worse it gets. So fatigue, I would just say you should expect half a 50-50 chance of getting fatigue. Yeah, the numbers alone pretty much kind of support that. Yeah. But like if you get down towards like uh, you know, let's say muscle pain, you're probably you're looking at somewhere between 10 and 20%. You know, if, if you just split the diff- you know, split the baby here. Um <laughs> Then, uh, then you get a, a good idea. Or, or new or worsened joint pain, so between six and eleven percent. That's probably a reasonable estimate. And again, these have scales on them for people who are who are just listening. You know, they have any mild, moderate, and severe. And I've just been talking about any as a category. So, any fatigue whatsoever is probably about a fifty-fifty chance. But severe fatigue, somewhere between half percent and one and a half percent chance yeah a lot of and these then, don't really yeah. rank too too highly in uh likely as far as severe reactions and the only one that yeah. looks like it really kind of stands out is fatigue yeah and that's that's kind of to be expected your body is is doing work when it is uh ramping up immunity here and that that's probably going to be the one we're going to find one of the the biggest discrepancy at these larger percentages and uh, headache being headache, the other one. Which, if we consider that this thing has a very heavy neurological comp- uh, component, then that... Eh, it's really going to be more of, like, just blood sugar and uh, and, and blood pressure. And uh, also, uh, sorry, uh, bands of constriction. So it's, it's interferon <laughs> causing its things. It's not going to directly give you a headache, but fluctuations in blood pressure and... Uh, and what the hell is the? It's something or another tensin um, that makes your blood vessels contract. So think like taking caffeine to get rid of a headache. That causes your blood vessels to contract. So when they loosen up, they can pulse with the with the heartbeat, and that gives you like a blood sugar headache, for example. Same deal. I thought uh, caffeine was a vasodilator. Not uh, a maybe it's, maybe it's the other way. Uh, yeah, I think it's. You think you're thinking the other way because any, anyway, the narrow blood vessels the other need more pressure. So it's one way or the other, and one of them you kind of feel the heartbeat in the surrounding tissue more. Um, so um, at the bottom of that table, table 17, you'll see it has use of antipyretic or pain medication. Think of that as just like taking Tylenol or Advil. So Tylenol is an example of an antipyretic and uh, analgesic Um uh, wait, wait a second. Uh, no, not analgesic. It's just a pain med. Uh, yeah, ibuprofen is an analgesic. You're getting out of my pay grade with terminology here, so I, I couldn't say. Yeah. Well, so so basically, um, Advil is an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti, uh, anti-inflammatory. And Tylenol is not an NSAID. It is just a pain medicine. Okay, so that is still an analgesic. It's uh, Advil is an anti-inflammatory. There we go. I just got back from spending a day at, at family, um, so it's a little scatterbrain here. No worries. That's all right. <laughs> okay, no so uh, and then they, they have more tables on this stuff. You can go down. There's more more tables on this. Now, if you look at the unsolicited uh, uh, adverse events, you know, still not great and all, but they exist. So um, then skipping down, skipping down. Serious adverse events. This is the one where it's probably going to be the, the stuff that people are more freaked out about. So, and keep in mind, this is all still within the study. This has nothing to do with any dumb fuckery that's been going on, say, over in England and what have, uh, what have you. Um, so, serious adverse events. First up there, they have the deaths. There are a total of six, so two vaccinated, four placebo. They make sure to tell you that of the 43,000-some-odd uh, enrolled patients, yeah, okay, the most important thing is that these are due to event. These are due to conditions that are present in general population, and there's no, there's no way, there's no chance really that these are due to being vaccinated or given a placebo. Like these were just events that were due to people having a certain health, and uh, and, and it not it was no different uh, in general population. So, so being in the well, test in group own and being out of says all deaths difference. represent events that occur in the general population of age, age groups where they occurred at a similar rate. So yeah. basically so, this um, is fairly normal. 
So uh, let's see. Both vaccine recipients were greater than 55 in age. Uh, one experienced cardiac arrest 62 days after vaccination. Two died three days later. So he had a heart attack. Um, and then the other died from arteriosclerosis three days after vaccination. One. Basically, same kind of problem. Placebo recipients died from myocardial infarction, so heart attack. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke, someone had a stroke. And then unknown causes for two of them. Three of the four deaths occurred in the older group, so greater than 55 years of age. All deaths represent, and this is right, I was saying the same thing, all deaths represent events that occur in general population of the age groups where they occurred at a similar rate. And, and due to the fact that people exist as single units and you know in injury units um they in fact occur at a greater rate in the general population but that you know not being here or there so non-fatal serious adverse events um same kind of stuff here the only one that really stood out was that uh and this is again just an oddity uh of, and this is a th i would say a statistical fluke um for the vaccine group um so there, there was it. Uh, uh, so it was appendicitis. So there was twelve participants that had appendicitis, eight in the vaccine group and four in the placebo group. Um, and that that that's an, that's the same way they talk about balancing shit with the the votes. You know the difference between the vote totals. This is one of those. This is an imbalance between test uh, test populations. So appendicitis was the only one that had a statistically significant. Um, imbalance, and that's that seems to be more or less a statistical fluke because there's such a, a small number of patients involved, mm -hmm. or small, small number of subjects involved, I should say. Uh, after that, though, pretty straightforward. I mean, the serious adverse events are otherwise uh, consistent with general population. So this is what I was looking for to see. Like, you know, was there? Was there a significant problem due to the vaccine? And then also, is there any significant uh, possibility of enhancement? There doesn't appear to be any po any reported possibility of enhancement. That also can come significantly later. So uh, the um, the the people who were given out the vaccines. So the the um, the participant was it the participant facilities or what have you? Uh, what the hell are they called? Stakeholder whatevers. They they are required to report as well as Pfizer once they have notice. Uh, they're all required to report within 15 days per normal to VIRS, uh, which is where you send uh, adverse events for vaccines. Uh, so reporting side effects, stuff like that. Um, they're all report required to report within 15 days. That's just generally true. Uh, and then they have a they have a monthly and quarterly reporting requirement. So um, any any adverse events and then just generally how things are going is going to be required to be reported um, uh, routinely and frequently. Uh, so those will be interesting to cut out. And in fact, the people who are going to be most at risk of enhancement are going to be the ones who are going to get it first. Uh, that would be the people who are most often exposed to the pathogen. So first responders, the people who are taking care of patients in hospitals, other critical uh, staff, and uh, then, of course, the uh, essential workers uh, workforce. So those are the people who are most likely to come into contact with the disease in the first place and with the virus. Uh, so if there's going to be an enhancement effect, we'll probably actually know relatively quickly because of that. Uh, well, yeah, just first responders are contact. certainly, uh, well, they're, they're going to be busy over the, uh, the next few months. We can we yeah. say that with a fair degree of certainty, no matter what happens in the near to immediate future. They are, they're going to have a lot of work to do. So, so uh, it's, it's annoying, actually, in, in, in a somewhat related uh, tangent here. Uh, I saw that in the you Neon know, Trending, which is, of course, a wonderful reflection of anything that matters in reality. I saw in Trending that, uh, that Bill Gates was talking with, who gives a shit, uh, some news person. And I still don't understand why the fuck anybody's talking to him. Um, he's not... He's not an epidemiologist. Like, at most, his foundation is paying for shit, and not I mean, even it's, that it's, much. It's no different than any other thing in our society, right? Like we we consult celebrities on all kinds of science yeah. shit all the time. We like, consult I, politicians who are no given, no no more advanced than lawyers at best. Given all the shit though that like that's been going on with with somehow we've managed to turn half the country into anti-vaxxers because they hate Trump. 
and the other half in the anti-vaxxers because Bill Bill fucking Gates won't shut his mouth. Hey, I, you know what? I, I'm I'm gonna sit sit in that uh, second half there. I I'm not touching this thing, not with a ten foot pole. And now so. here's something I only recently heard about, and I'll have to look to see if I can find something mm-hmm. to back it up because it was just in passing. But I'm told there could be some adjutants in this that uh, adjutants adjutants. Excuse me. Yeah, I, medical terminology isn't my uh. Is so an favorite. adjuvant. Adjuvants just basically enhance the impact, the ability of the vaccine to work. Right. Well, what I stimulating though, your body to cont- to do the immune response. Right. But what I've heard though is that these two adjuvants they can lead to female sterilization. So it's it's not as much it's not as much that it's actually the core of the thing itself. So what this is actually having you do, and this is one of the reasons why I am opposed to it, right? Um, not not necessarily opposed to it for older folks. Like if you're already past your fertility prime, go right ahead. By all means, take some mRNA into your into your cells and reproduce the protein. But what it does is it has a uh, the the actual vaccine is replicating a strand of amino acids that are very similar to the same spike proteins that uh, human it beings literally. use as. It, it oh, is literally on. okay. It's the literal. It's, it's the spike protein from the virus. It, it's not just the spike protein from the virus. It's the exact same spike protein that we use for uh, placental implantation in human beings. So there is a potential that we are accidentally or inadvertently going to increase in fertility, not necessarily in the already existing embryos, but in future embryos because it's the same spike protein that we use. We got it from a virus. A lot of our, a lot of uh, evolutionary trends well, sure, come viral from viral. Cool. Right. So, so it's actually it's very, very similar to our uh, our spike proteins that we use to uh, to allow us to be placental mammals. And I find that uh, in terms of of things that sketch me out just a little bit. The people who six months, six to nine months ago were claiming that, you know, we're having a worldwide crisis because human beings have overpopulated the planet (laughs) are the same ones who are now saying, hey, everybody who's over the age of 16 should take this brand new vaccine that may cause a little tiny bit of infertility. All right. So here's here's the thing where I have to go ahead and step in and say some of this here is just going to be fucking bullshit. Unless this virus causes infertility in the same way. It has it in the exact same way. You then know, I, I don't know about that. Is not going, and the vaccine is not going to cause it. I'm just saying right I, there. That's, 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 not, that's not entirely true, right? Because if we train it to be specific to a protein, right? That's what your body does the, anyway, though. It does some of that. It does. There's a lot of other things that it picks up on. I, right, I just, sure. I've, I've heard that argument. I've heard that argument, no, but look, you're until not wrong until we get proteins, but until we get time. until we get long-term studies right. on this not having an impact, which we're not going to get for at least five to seven years. If we were looking for it, I'm not going to touch it. I don't so actually. Here, it's not really for me. It'd be more like that. women. Now, here, here's what I'm going to say on this. SARS has basically the same spike protein, slightly different, mind you, but basically the same. And we have longer term data on SARS that we can go back and look at. Fair enough. Okay. And what's the uh, what's the TLDR on said findings then? Well, as far as I understand, and keep in mind I haven't looked at it recently, so that's important. So I can't say this authoritatively or anything, but from recollection of studies I looked at as recently as say 2016. There didn't appear to be a major fertility issue. More of the issue was that there was lung scarring, blah blah. The long term sequelae mostly involved pulmonary problems. So lung. I, you issues. know what? You know what? I'm really okay with my two in ten thousand for my age group risk of death, because the two in ten thousand of my age group risk of death were people who were already out the door. So. All COVID did was show them the door. Said, "Hey, there's yeah, a see, free the world death, outside." The risk of death, like I said before, the the death is not the only shitty outcome, and death is I, by far. If you're gonna go down that road. Death is the least likely of the shitty outcomes. Then I, you know what, I, I this stuff comes up uh, every single time we start looking at diseases. All of them have some sort of negative impact, right? And all of that tends to be grossly overstated. 
right? I, I really okay. struggle with people turning around and telling me the long-term impacts of an illness that's only been around for nine months, right? We have, we have, like, so, so the whole, the whole reason why people are even worried about it is because we have analogs to look back on that had significant bad effects come out of them. We have data now for months, not years, obviously. We have months of data. Yeah, sure. That months of data. That indicate either the presence of short-term pretty shitty effects or the the basically the uh, the progression in kind with long-term shitty effects or outcomes. I, and again, you know, I, I live in a world of actual hazards. Right. This doesn't rank very high compared to asbestos. This doesn't rank very high oh, come, compared come with on. lead. Especially, yeah, no, I'm no. sorry. I'm sorry. Let's like Where let's put it into get into a, Where no, like, okay, Mr. Like, I'm, I am I am asbestos in the rest of the country. Uh well, you know, it's kind of okay. like everywhere and in everything produced prior to 1984, or so besides that. Uh-huh. I, so I, many, I'm just saying homes, how many homes I'm are just you saying be in? that this is not a crisis. I don't see it as a crisis. I haven't seen any presentation of it as a crisis, except for a whole bunch of people who make money on selling it as a crisis. I understand that there are potential shitty impacts. I get that. Yeah. I, I, I totally, 100% am on board with there are potentially shitty impacts. Right. But we also have the technology. I right. mean, like, the, the, thing, the majority of Americans gotta, are not going to lose out on lung capacity. I've, I've got to call no, you out on this one point, though. This one fucking point, though, that you've decided to gloss over. You're sitting there complaining about the vaccine and the possibility of these certain issues because it's producing this protein that is already going to be picked up on by your immune system from the Maybe. virus. And then, and then saying, I'd rather get the fucking virus. I, except, right, again, I see, don't... You gotta see how that just completely... I, I just, don't, I don't so see it as... That is so backwards. The, the thing so is that you're, you would have... you rather have, have had chicken pox or not? That kind of thing. Yes, I would have rather had chicken pox rather than get I would have rather gotten the goddamn food. vaccine. <laughs> well, I had chicken pox, so, so it really, like, really like it wasn't it wasn't a crisis. A... No, the vaccine came out like relatively soon after I had I, the fucking I, thing too. I understand what you're saying that it's going to be similar and blah blah blah, and there could be long term. The, the 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 effects might My be the point same. Here is that the concerns you have about the vaccine are the same concerns you should be rationally having about the virus itself. I, and then I, you're talking about not caring about getting the virus. There are. Wonder, well, then what the fuck was the point of being when upset? We, when we start talking about antibodies, your antibody response to an actual virus is right. not based off of a single protein. Right. Right. But it's based off point of a, is, it's going your, to your be, body it's going to does not recognize protein. something and go, oh my god, that one amino acid chain, that's a threat. It's like all of this shit. Yeah, it recognizes that. Point out, that there is. No, Whereas this, this is just that one chance. protein. There's just there's one not protein. A single fucking yeah, because it was the one and, that triggered it the and, strongest. And, and and this is a minor pet peeve, but this isn't a fucking vaccine, right? A vaccine is dead virus that we administer to the cells. It's different than inoculation, uh, which is a yeah, virus yeah. that we administer. Or, or we can are calling or something. anything. Right. A vaccine this is anything that causes you to become a this... immune. No. No, that inoculations and vaccines are two completely Come subcategories on, of the same effect. <laughs> they should be not. They shouldn't be calling something a vaccine when it's not a vaccine. Okay, right? Well, like this there. is a brand new thing. It's a it small pet sure. peeve. It's now, a really cool it thing. Used, it has been used before. That is important. This is not a sure. It is a novel use of a technology. Absolutely, it's the first yep. time it's ever been used for vaccination. But it has been used before. And it didn't cause, you know, mutant randos to go walking down the road with three arms. I, I don't think I've ever claimed that there's a mutant you rando problem that I'm you're concerned not, about. You're not an idiot, so you wouldn't. <laughs> but my point is, my point is, this is a proven technology that is being used and, in a new place. And, and, fine. and I would be very excited if I could be a mutant rando <laughs> with a third arm, because stranger in the bedroom, folks, that would be great. <laughs> Are you going right Wait, here? You're going you lefty tonight? Have, no, I'm going forehead. That's what he, what happens when you walk into the bar. Guess what else I got more than one of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really okay with a third arm. Maybe even a fourth or a fifth. Like I'm okay with going human centipede here, and not that nasty like. <laughs> 
Hell. You said it, man. You said it. You know what? You want someone you. sewed up to your asshole? <laughs> there, you want? Or do you want like what was it, it's... Human Centipede Three, where he goes to the fucking prison and sews together like a hundred inmates and takes the limbs off? I mean, that, was, that wouldn't that was be a horrible. If, movie. It, if it takes the if it takes the limbs off, then it's not really a centipede anymore. It's just a worm. Well, no, he he called it something else, but like. <laughs> it was Human Centipede 3. His big problem. I like how every movie he gets killed, and every fucking movie he comes back. It's the same guy. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's no different than uh, than Tremors with Burt Gummer. Right. Or, yeah. I'll, right? no, like, don't care if Gummer ever dies, though. He's just like, you know, either fucks off or... Well, yeah. Okay, so I'll give you this. In the okay, last first one, off, he theoretically died. The last one? Which one? The, the oh, one yeah, in the, the snow it, it, or the Tremors island? Six? The Tremors island. Nine? The snow came did he die? the island. Well, it, it, did he die on like, the island? Yeah, that, well, that's that's what I thought was like theoretically what happened there. And they like no, they I don't think his, so. They, they buried it and they put the hat on the rocks and. No, no, he went back to his his merry his merry damn island. Like they, I think they cut him out of it. Right, the last scene is is uh, they kill I'll it. I'll have to go watch it again. Fuck. And it. I'm pretty sure they dug him out and and it ate him. Yeah, but I he, thought uh, he died. Yeah. Though. No, I think they they just slid it and he came oh. back out and it was like kind of like the first one. No, because it landed after it went through the through the fucking rock. It landed on the other side, like exploded or something. Yeah, I'll, yeah. again, I'll have to go watch it again. Well, this is I, some I, really you know, deep Tremors lore right here. <laughs> Trem this Tremors, by the way, this by the way, highly relevant to COVID nineteen. You should it, it not is... be talking about this <laughs> unless you have thoroughly, unless you have memorized detail for detail. At Tell you least what, the first when, four Tremors movies. When when Burt Gummer says the vaccine is safe, I will believe it. <laughs> As if he fucking would, right? I think he that's the point. He would, he would probably want tinfoil on the fucking needle. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm to understand uh, this correctly, then what what we're saying is basically all men should get the vaccine and all women shouldn't. I you know I I'd be okay. You know well, I sure. I'm not gonna touch it. I'm not going to touch it regardless because it does skeeve me out. Again, I accept yeah. it as a new technology, and I accept me being skeeved out is not a, a scientific preference. preference. It's just a – it it's skeeves a me preference. out. Right? It's a personal preference. And look, and, and here's the other thing. If you don't get the vaccine and that's – like if you have like a reason why like I just take out by it, yep. fine. Fine. That's – Look, like that you is, should – you should get it, but if you not get, if you can't tolerate it mentally like that, fine. I, I am, what I would ask you to do is not immediately turn to I'm somebody okay. else who's like, I'm getting the vaccine, and I go, dude, why? You shouldn't do that. The celebrity I, told me not I, to. I am, I am okay with the concept. I would be okay with genetic modification of the concept. Oh, god damn it. I don't know if um, Cuomo's going to let Sorry. you be okay with that. So. Cuomo um, needs to fucking okay. So that guy, I, that guy is the closest thing to Hitler we've got besides Shinny Jinpu. All right. I am. I am okay with the concept. I'm okay with everything about the concept. I just don't want. Like, I'd be okay with genetic modification if I gained a technical advantage. Right. Well, like, I'm okay with that. A technical advantage. I don't <laughs> think. No. No. I think my <laughs> system can can take it. <laughs> Like a, a real, a real significant oh, upgrade. You're gonna, you're gonna eat that shit. You're gonna eat that the entire yeah, fucking Yeah, 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 yeah. A real advantage, not a. I'm going. I'm gonna. I'm and, going and to again, bury you with that the again, entire night. Again, I also am kind of skeeved out that the same people who just months ago were complaining about human overpopulation and how they were going to figure out a way to solve it, being the ones who are the financial backers of this brand new okay, thing so... that kind of looks like fertility. <laughs> Hi, my it kind of looks like an infertility like to drug. sell you a vaccine. Right. So, so here's, here's the way I would, I would – I'm really it. concerned about climate change. Would you please take this vaccine, yeah. all you young folks? So, so here, here's, here's the thing I would say about this. I would be equally worried about any woman getting the fucking disease at that point. I, and and I don't I think and, and I don't care system. about like if we're if we're not if we're not talking about like infecting others or anything else right now. I would just I would be equally worried. If that was a, a true valid concern, and, and I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying, like, in the context of that being a direct valid concern about the vaccine itself, I can I, see I, that. 
I can see I that. Understand. I understand. I would also what you're immediately saying. say that the the immediate equal concern would be that you didn't want any woman at the virus who I, wants to have kids. See, I I don't. The, where I disagree on that is that I, from my understanding of the immune system, it is not based off of a single protein, right? But here's the so thing. so when it is it that, is a it complex is array, impossible. but it's a complex <laughs> array of proteins. And biomarkers that it's your immune not, system responds to. It's not as it's not complex that as you make it out thing. to be, though. It's not as but two things. One, it's not as complex as you make it out to be. Two, this is the most important here. When your body makes antibodies, it is a, it is marker specific, meaning it is it is shit sticking off of the thing specific. For COVID, there are sure. basically two that stick off. There's the one that will adhere to another cell. That's the one that is currently targeted. And there's the one that allows it to enter the cell. Those I, the I just, big, those are the two by far most populous on the surface. Sure. sure. And, sure. I, I, and I understand what you're saying. It, when anybody sticks to it, it doesn't look to see what other antibodies are sticking to. It sticks to one protein. I, I understand what you're saying. So it is a statistical impossibility that your body is not going to be making these antibodies anyway. I, I hear what you're numbers. saying, Craig. I hear what you're saying. Okay. I'm just I just gotta make I, that part clear. I, I understand what you're saying. I understand that you believe. I gotta that it make it clear for is, you right? and for whoever's listening. Okay, that this, well, that but... this is an important thing here that, that these things, these proteins, are going to be given made antibodies for, regardless of whether or not it's in the vaccine or from getting infected. I I I understand what you're saying. That will happen. I just am skeeved out by the whole the, the group of people who are backing it. A sure. And and on the second hand, that it looks awfully similar to this rather than something else. Right. And and in general, I agree with you. Your your immune system is nothing more than a shitty friend or foe recognition system. Right. Kinda, yeah. Like right, pretty much pretty much it's oh, either it's, it's, it's supposed to be like, in me or it's not. Now imagine imagine to, to put it in context, imagine if your friend or foe system required you to be A blind and B to use your hands to feel whether or not it's a terrorist. Yeah, like, probably. Imagine walking up to somebody and mashing your hands in their face. In which case in which case they like you. In which case, stranger in the bedroom reigns supreme. I'm just telling you, third arm all the way. I can get a real good feel. Still hey, man, just... you should get your ass <laughs> I mean, if you're really this hype about it, you really ought to go out and get this mRNA vaccine, because I'm hearing hey, people well, say Hey, well, I mean, that, if, it, uh, you know, this if it allowed your, me your to get a third arm, easily... I would go for it. Well, what I'm hearing from uh, some of the conspiracy circles is that this makes your whole uh, genetic sequence easier to modify down the line. So, man, hop okay, right yeah, all right, no, no, stop, stop here. Let me let me just go ahead and help you out with this one. If you've ever gotten yourself a vaccine in the past and you trusted the doctor to put the vaccine into your arm, and you're complaining about it now because somebody else told you to be upset about it. You have to go ahead and reevaluate your sources of information and why you were trusting things in the past. I'm not saying that you should have trusted things in the past or that you should trust things now, etc. But if that is what triggered you to have a discrepancy, you should do yourself the favor of reestablishing your fact basis and moving forward from there. Because if you can't trust your doctor to give you well-founded, reasonable concise explanations for what's going on while you're getting a vaccine, I then mean, you shouldn't be trusting some, you know, some any, jackass any, on a any forum. Any engineer, any engineer worth his salt acknowledges that doctors are just basically blind proctologists playing around and taking guesses. Like they sure. may be, they may be Where's scientifically medical, valid well, guesses, but they're no, still. No. Yes. No, 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 no. Let's not let's not do that because there's a big difference between medicine and medical science, and you know that too. Yes, I do. <laughs> a huge difference, and anybody I, I, who's a doctor who I says paid, we do paid, science is uh, bullshitting you. Yeah, I know. I, I paid eight hundred goddamn dollars for a diagnosis, like, like probably six, seven years ago. I still have no fucking clue what was wrong with me. I, I, every time I went to the doctor, they just gave me a new set of twelve different pills. I got like 24, and they're like, eventually something's going to kill what's growing on you. So, you know, that's... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off with this topical cream and go straight to... Oh, no, they, it was, it was like... Here. 
I would. I it was. Uh, I I had like. I all of a sudden I woke Dr. up and it was like a football size thing that had grown under my arm, right? Ugh. So I went to the I went to walk in center and they gave me six pills and my fever kept getting worse. So I went to the emergency room because I was at like a hundred and four yeah, or whatever. Then. I well, they it, I don't know what it was, but I had a hundred and four okay. fever. So I go That's to the emergency bad. room. Yeah. And the doctor turns around and he just gives me another six pills. And I said, what is wrong with me? He goes, I don't know. Try these. At that point, I'd immediately say, uh, biopsy, figure it the fuck out. Right? I was like, why don't you just drain it? Well, you, it's getting you have, bigger. You have the right to sit there and say, doctor, the fuck. Do your job. Yes. Fix me, God. Do your job or get me another doctor who will. You're allowed to say that. They are. They are. Glorified butchers, that's what they are. No, those are surgeons. No, well, yeah. The other ones, the other ones are the ones who, tur- who base the turkey first before they stick the pork ah, in. Ah, got it. Ah, See, they're the, no. ones, they're the ones who prep the sauce. It, no, no, no self-respecting engineer respects a doctor. It, it's just the way Look, it is. I respect a doctor for doing the job they do, but I don't respect the job they do. I, I respect the doctor <laughs> for being the barrier between me and being able to acquire what I need. <laughs> Like that's uh, that's their fundamental place in my world. You know, so so there is a big difference between a doctor who does that, which is not being a doctor, and a doctor who actually gives a shit and tries to find out what the fuck's wrong with you. Yeah, yeah, but they only have fifteen minutes. That's uh, it's like Jeopardy on, you know. You see, that's lots that's of difference. drugs. This is why you go. This is why you get yourself a GP who knows what the hell they're doing. Find yourself an internal medicine doctor to be your GP, and then either that or a family practitioner. And then just I, stick with them, and and you know avoid the fucking ED as much as possible, because they well, see, they see, really I, only have fifteen minutes. I I end up in the ED all the time because I have a tendency to injure myself. Dumbass. I I it's not. I I, I am I am too. It's okay. It's just that it's you know. Every, I fell from a standing position. I slipped on dog vomit all the way down <clears> the stairs. <throat> These are not things that I do intentionally. Now, I should hope not. Tossing blenders into the air and catching them blades open that was a dumb thing to do that's on me dude really <laughs> yeah. but the rest of it no yeah and you're the one sitting there doctors are dumbasses <laughs> hey hey listen listen i trust my skills i had no hand-eye coordination after engineering school but that's okay mm-hmm. you know being an engineer you should have kind of maybe tested your theories beforehand but I- who am I to say? I'm just a layman. Oh, uh, how does that taste going down? Ah, uh, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've actually got a really interesting okay. article that I just want to drop on the both of you guys. You may have seen it. It's about a galaxy not being destroyed by a black hole. Cool. And uh, they've got one going on, uh, and it's it's eating up uh, the material from everything around it, but everything around it is producing enough material that it just keeps going. To put it in simple terms. Hold on a second. Okay, okay, and this, this is clearly going to be written by some dumbass. Uh, okay, yeah. Universities, Space Research Association. So this person just likes to write shit. Okay. Uh, black holes are thought to gobble up so much blah blah blah. Galaxy that's surviving the ravenous forces of a quasar by continuing to birth new stars. Okay. Let's go ahead and be very clear on what this means. Because, because this is very important as a distinction here. When it says producing new stars, that does not mean synthesizing matter from the fucking ether. That means shit's getting brighter. And that happens when there's a high shear rate or a shockwave that passes through a dense hydrogen cloud anyway. So what that means is that it is creating new stars from turbulence as it's consuming stars that are already lit up. So it's still gobbling shit up quite quite quickly. It's just that the luminosity of the galaxy is probably gonna probably relatively consistent as it's heating up from the uh, the accretion. Well. <clears throat> Actually, having read over the article earlier, it's uh, what is it? This a cold quasar? It's basically mm-hmm. just pumping out enough energy to feed the black hole, and they're okay. in a balancing act, you could say. Well, so so the black hole funnels energy from the incoming matter that basically misses the uh, the, the event horizon, 
it funnels a lot of energy outward in those two jets by twisting the uh, magnetic and electric fields around it to, to form these focused beams that are truly terrifying in their scope, but they are quite narrow and focused on a, on a galactic scale. Uh, even on an intergalactic scale, they're still quite tight beam. Um, so that energy output is coming from the material of the accretion disk falling in and missing the event horizon. So these these are gigantic mass to energy conversion engines, uh, is what they really are. Did you say missing the event horizon? Basically, uh, that's not accurate. They don't miss the event horizon. The event horizon is just an arbitrary point in space at right. which the yeah, speed but what's of light not... is okay. This is important. They don't fall in and come back out. How about that? That would be reasonably true. Although that's actually, I mean. there's. There There's actually energy. some debate the ergo, as to what happens at not the core the of the black hole. Not the, okay, we can assume that the black hole is rotating. I'm not talking about flinging through the ergosphere here. I'm talking about missing that entirely. So when these jets form, the EM fields, the way they're constructed inside, which is stupidly complicated already, basically you can get kind of hoovering effects towards the outside poles. It doesn't Hoover. Well, Look, yeah, a nice and a specific. Hoover, what have you, it vacuum shit up. It doesn't vacuum either. How can it it's be? It's in the vacuum of space, damn it. This has gotten a little. This is all facetious, by the way. If you're listening, this is just us being dicks. Well, me being a dick, more importantly. Yeah, fair enough. But there was another one. I mean, there really isn't a lot more. It's, of that this topic. is interesting. That, that, it is absolutely so, fascinating, and they'll be this, in the this building. Is, this would tell me that it's a nascent, um, it's a nascent quasar that it's it's still not picked up enough to uh, to kind of blow things away from the from the center, or just pull things in hard uh, that hard. Like it's either really early in its evolution, or this is like the transition from a quasar to a quiescent galaxy. Now that said, what, uh, this is I'm getting way outside of my uh, field of expertise on this, and I'm wondering if one of you guys can actually give me an answer. Oh, I can give you an answer that does not necessarily okay, mean you give me a, you, okay. you well, hold on, let me put out the question and ask if I can get a good <laughs> answer. Um, what uh, good? Good is see. relative. God Fair it. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> what is Hawking radiation, and what effect on what is real? Does it have? Not much. Uh, very, yeah. very radiation. little. Very yeah. little. So Hawking radiation is uh, theoretical radiation that would come through. It's actually so Hawking's radiation is proposed as the primary mechanism for which uh, wormholes connecting two points in space time cannot uh, exist. So sure. essentially, and it has more to do with like uh, specifically. Uh. Uh, wormholes connected at two points in time rather now, than two points it's in also, space. It's, most importantly, it is the primary mechanism for which, through which a black hole radiates energy and dissipates inside. That too. That too. Now, that, that's where people are going to most frequently recognize it from. Uh, and it's not so the way Hawking proposed it is not specific that it's radiation leaving a black hole so much as it is a gravitational phenomenon that precludes certain frequencies of radiation from existing. That said, the out the effect of that is that radiation does leave a black hole as some in some form of uh, sorry energy leaves the black hole in some form of energy, and it can only have specific wavelengths that are that fill the holes of this uh, this distant observer's uh, viewpoint. Now, what the what the the mechanism by which that is proposed to happen is that you have this uh, these virtual particle pairs that that pop into existence and then annihilate again. Uh, near the event horizon, and then they have a wide band of frequencies that they do the, of of energies at which they, these things happen, and then at certain wavelengths of or so certain energy levels, uh, one you know the particle or the antiparticle on average both falls into the black hole, and then the other one leaves, and as it leaves, it meets up with another with its opposing particle in the pair. And then uh, sends uh, at least one of the two photons from annihilating away from the black hole. So basically, 
the idea is that the the gravitational um, warping of space time provides the energy basis for the selection of energies allowed, and the uh, the kind of quantum foam, if you will, the the particles annihilating and and reappearing um, all over the place provide the energy source for this to actually happen. And then the consequence is that the black hole shrinks uh, by giving up this energy. Which leads and us to it's the direct, question of it's direct what mass happens, conversion to energy. So what happens so, when a black hole collapses? What's the well, it's, it's, when it, it's, it's evaporating more than it's collapsing. Fair, fair. And eventually, um, so this happens faster as the black hole gets smaller. It's black body radiation effectively, so it's uh, inverse temperature to the fourth power. So a black hole that's very large is very cold. And then uh, as it gets smaller, this process speeds up at uh, a proportion of, of roughly the radius of the fourth power. So inverse radius of the fourth power. So as it gets tiny, it evaporates much, much, much faster. This is why, by the way, when they talk about black holes showing up in the LHC, they would, uh, if they did happen, they would, ev- they would evaporate and disappear before they even got close to the wall of the, of the device. And if they happened, uh, if they did show up, they would be showing up in our upper atmosphere all the fucking time. So it, it would only be, it would only, they would only potentially exist in that device if they already definitely existed in our upper atmosphere. So people who are worried about a black hole being produced that would eat up the whole planet had no sound basis to to declare that this was a a, a reason to stop the project. Because there's energy, there are, there are cosmic rays coming in at way higher energies than you can produce in the LHC, like or, several orders of magnitude larger than you can produce in the LHC, all the time upper atmosphere. In fact, the way that the uh, that so give you an idea, you know about the relativistic uh, contraction of distances, the entirety of the Earth's atmosphere is less than the width of a nickel to a cosmic ray coming in that produces a muon cascade. So just to give you an idea of how much length contraction we're talking about here with these, uh, these, okay. these energy quick, scales. What's a muon, muon uh, cascade? So um, basically a cosmic ray strikes uh, oxygen or nitrogen in the atmosphere, produces a muon, uh, and that decays, creates a, a kappa muon, and then it's, it's then a, it was a kappa or a kappa, whatever. They're they're subatomic particles. They don't have very much mass. They're They're very they're kind of like, yeah, they're they're kind of like shitty photons. So, um, a muon, for reference, has a a half life. I think it's around a microsecond, ten to the minus six, which is what. So that's more than enough time to use it for study in the LHC when you're looking at, say, heavy hydrogen. Where they replace an electron with a muon, which is cool. Yeah, but that's part of that's because but at least when the, the, not when the stuff's coming shit. in the low LHC, the LHC stuff is getting pretty close to relativistic velocities. Yeah, and so the the ten to the six muon, right? Yeah, okay. So it's a really really small period of time. It's got a very minimal travel distance between yeah. where it's created and the actual sensors. Yeah. So so the point there is that there, that is that is way more than the, the amount of time you need to study it in situ. But it's also way less than uh, than you'd notice outside of that scenario. So a, a muon doesn't really exist for very long, and so the cascade is is the decay chain. You can think of it like nuclear decay, but it has it's nowhere else related, uh, and besides the the fact that it breaks down to these other things, and so that that decay chain that cascade is crashing into uh, lower energy particles. Uh, it, so basically, creating these these lower energy, more stable particles as it decays. So um, you can look up like uh, uh, cosmic rays and muons on your own, um, and you'll see that there's like there's this kind of decay chain that occurs. But the the point is that a muon, the reason why the muon cascade starts so low in the atmosphere, uh, where people thought it would be happening much higher up, is because the atmosphere is so thin to cosmic rays. Like like I said, it's less than the width of a nickel. Yeah, people it's quite um, attraction. I have trouble kind of uh what what should I say conceptualizing just how small the earth is in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. It, it's it's very difficult to perceive. It, I mean 
Oh, we have people with the that say the Earth is flat. Yeah. So. yeah, we do, and that's 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 you know a lot of atoms. Ten to the twenty-six is a gigantic fucking number. It is. It is a. Uh, I mean, that's only if you're using like and kilogram like, well, moles and. Well, well, when we're, when we're talking about things like the LHC, they talk about sending around packets of like say a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand uh, proton. Yep. I, I mean, that it, is that is like that is ten to the fifth. And then the, a mole is ten to the twenty sixth. It's just the, such a huge difference. The so craziest when talk thing, about like making gold out of lead, you'd have to be doing that for longer than humanity's ever existed, longer than the, like the life the lifespan of the universe to make an appreciable amount of gold out of a lead target. Just as an example. The uh, so you're saying it's very difficult. Works. It's very difficult to conceptualize the Earth in the context of the universe. But what's uh, what's actually a much more interesting thing is to con uh, conceptualize how little matter there is in the reality of the universe. Because sure. even when we're dealing with something like the Earth itself, almost everything that we see, feel, touch, and exist on is is basically a void, right? Yeah. There's a the, you have a tiny amount of nucleus and a very small amount of electron repulsion that keeps you from going through the Earth. But at the end of the day, there's very little physical matter in existence. Yeah. Mostly just energy excitations and wave and uh, yep. uh, these uh, quantum fields, but that's and that's all yeah, of matter space anyway. Is very very it, empty. It, it is it is very very empty until all of a sudden you know a universe is born because God right. knows that could happen technically at any time. Well, the other interesting thing is uh, when we t when people talked about the Higgs, the Higgs mechanism before, the mass that they're trying to explain is like less than a percent of the mass that we perceive inside of a proton or a neutron to begin with. The rest of that mass is bound up relativistically in gluons that are holding the damn thing together. So most of the mass is from the fact that there's just so much energetic vibration and shit going on inside the little area we define to be a proton or a neutron. But there's this t there's a tiny amount of mass that's in there that has to be explained by something else. And it turns out the Higgs mechanism, or at least what's been observed to be the Higgs mechanism, uh, appears to be uh, valid enough to explain it. And to put that very quickly, the Higgs mechanism is what gives mass to matter. Why right. things so, weigh. I, so we think. We think. So, yeah, kind of. Yeah, I, I I think, think of it like, so if you go to a pool, right, and you see the ripples on the ceiling of the light, it's that kind of thing where they, the interaction with uh, the, the bending and the forcing and the flexing of the particle creates physical mass in that field. It's what, yeah. what does that. So it's, it's kind of like a lensing excited. effect. You could say that the Higgs field is why we are. Sure. I and mean, so yeah. It's also part of a proposed mechanism for the production for the production of asymmetry in mass um, that allowed matter versus antimatter to, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. This is the part where the social constructionists finally have a fucking point. What we call matter could very easily just be called antimatter, and everything else would still be exactly the same. I, I mean, of the coin. But point being, there's an asymmetry that allowed one form to dominate over the other, and the Higgs mechanism is part of one of the proposed solutions. It, there's uh, there's a variety of and it could be a wrong. Variety of different just, that's proposed what we've got mechanisms. Right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the thing is, well, the, I like the, the chirality Higgs... thing. With the uh, with the um, the uh, with which neutrino was it? There's the one neutrino where the one chirality of it is is diff behaves differently than the other, uh, and it's only due to the Higgs mechanism that it's capable of showing up in the first place. I it, it, I don't play around with neutrinos; they're kind of useless anyway. to me. So, well, they I, might but have there, there are the there point. are a variety of different <laughs> proposals for why the universe exists as matter yeah. rather than antimatter. And, and by and, the way, most of them occur before the electroweak force split. So that's way, way, way long ago, and very close to the Big Bang. Like within the first ten to the minus what ten to the minus thirty five or whatever. Well, yeah, it, it's what is that? That's yeah. It's around there. Well, no, because the the Big Bang kind of brought everything into existence. I mean, theoretically, the the theory sure. goes the theory goes that there is a membrane that separates our universe and another mem universe, sure. right? And it's constantly vibrating. So this, this, is, this is M theory, by the way. This is yeah. So so the 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 constant vibrations, uh, where basically you know it's getting like waves. You know, it flexes in on our side yeah. and down on their side and in on our side, and it's just kind of like these little ripples. But some of these ripples are statistically larger than the other ripples. 
and it, it, yeah. when one statistically large enough occurs, uh, it is basically this massive burst of energy. And then once it expands into our universe, it cools. And once the uh, the, the the energy yeah, cools, you're living it becomes in the cinders of that. <laughs> the what? I said we're living in the cinders of one of these events. It's yeah, kind of basically that. that yeah, that's this that's is, a pretty good way biggest, to put it. This is the the largest uh, smattering of nuclear fallout, so to speak. We are we are an ash particle on a bonfire. Right. And this, this and is the, this is the shitty smoky remnants of it. The real all the fun happened a long time ago. Well, that all depends on how you define fun. Okay, so three arms in a bedroom should be, could be fun, but you know let's. Let's That's say exactly that right. cos- on a cosmic scale, all the fun happened a long, a long while ago. Well, I mean, it, it all depends, right? So, so the the theory goes, and to continue on, one of the other things, and kind of where I support, throw my weight behind, is um, there is a potential decay difference between uh, sure. matter and antimatter, and so the only downside to this this hypothesis is we should be able to detect more antimatter, and for some whatever reason we're not really seeing it, but right. the alternate decay hypothesis is let's say uh you know matter decays in one second and or let's say matter decays over 10 seconds and antimatter decays over one second for its half-lives there would be so most of the matter and antimatter would constantly be colliding releasing photons exciting other stuff and it would just be just kind of like the ultra's build but if the antimatter decays off faster than the matter then eventually what ends up happening is there's the only thing you have left is going to be matter because uh, yeah. the smaller and smaller amount of antimatter will keep colliding with the now, matter and basically ceasing to exist. Keep in mind that when he's saying a, te- a second and 10 seconds, and if, if, a memory, if memory serves here from what you're referencing, th- that, is, that is just to highlight the example here. The, the real yes. difference we're talking about is like, in the t- in the tenth or eleventh decimal place. Yes, it, it is. It is it very, is very very super tiny. It's but very slight. Yeah. The 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 theory is that the amount of mass and energy that was originally in the universe is a fraction of what was what actually survived. So, uh, yeah. or what what survived is a fraction of the original mass energy of the universe, uh, because some of it well, went we away as part of annihilation. What it is. We can calculate roughly right. the original like well energy density. We don't know how much energy there was. We don't know how big the universe it was, but we know roughly how dense it was. We still don't know how big there. the universe is. Sure, we know how, we know how far away we can see, and that's all we're going to be able to see. Which is which is by the way really irritating that everybody's like ah it's because we can see this far away that means that's how big the universe is, and you're like well, that's, no. that's as far as we're concerned that's kind of what we can see. That said, though, you have things like the Great Attractor, and then uh, there's another one of those. Uh, but the Great Attractor is something that is beyond the 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 uh, the ninety two was it the was it ninety two odd million uh, or billion light years across whatever that we can see. It, it's, it's the, so so the the the, the Great theory Attractor is... is beyond that horizon. And just so if you take it, if you look at the peculiar motion of of uh, the cosmos. And you take you basically take away all other gravitational sources that are present. There's something beyond the horizon of of the visible universe, some some remnant of something that is drawing everything we can see in a single direction, which is which is called the great attractor. Well, there, there's there's a couple different possibilities. One is right. that we are the limitations in what we can see puts us right. into basically a field of fluence that when we sit there and we look backwards and forward, it looks like we're all moving the same direction because right. we're just like one very tiny little oh, another great example, sphere of visibility. Another great example of, uh, of how this could be wrong is so there's there's uh, the possibility that we're near the edge of a, a super void, if you will, um, or we're just unique in our position. Like... These these are all possible. There's a whole bunch of other ones out there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions that we can't really answer until we can get out there and look ourselves. So the great attractor is one of these, but it's a, like even a remnant if, of gravity that might be there. Going going with how uh, small and insignificant the Earth is, even if we get out there, we <laughs> still won't have a fucking clue as to what's going on. Well, here's the thing: we as a species, we wouldn't be able to get wherever out there is by the time we. So, so we are we are way past the point where our ability to to see something that far away is ever going to be possible. Yeah. Um, 
So, so while well, with while you can't any move current through understanding space, of technology and well, here's the thing: while travel. you can't move, so suppose we had a wormhole, maybe you, you might be able to make an argument, but we have to be able to target somewhere else. See, that's that's why Stargate that. is the superior form of sci-fi travel. It right. just they solved the wormhole problem by having two generators on opposite sides of the galaxy with a dialing mechanism. Right, but you know, like a fucking phone. <laughs> Yeah, you, remember, you, you know remember, what? The people you know who what? made the series all had fucking dial-up phones. When when <laughs> fucking ring phones. When your uh, when when your cell phone can materialize a P ninety right. through it, then I will take your argument with consideration. Until then, Stargate is superior. Oh no, I, I ble- dude, Stargate's the fucking shit. I seriously <laughs> want them to come back with another one that like makes oh, SGU. <laughs> actually do it it's like dude season two is so great and then they it, cocked it up if they if they retconned if they retconned all of sgu and started with the original premise and just sure. rebooted the whole thing i i wouldn't oh, mind like if they got rid of that fucking love triangle shit in the middle of it oh yeah, my, that'd be well great. i mean how about how about every single you know you're you're on a spaceship you have no life support you have yeah, no let's food let's, let's go let's go murder everybody <laughs> Let's poison the water first. That's a brilliant idea. Nope. Yeah, that would require, yeah. you know, people in Hollywood. Hey, and they the have these fucking kinos. What are they doing with those? Oh, they're all just bitching to them. Yes. Sure. And Steve has uh, taken off. He's got some things to do. May join us. Uh, may not. As, uh, you know, we all took a quick break there, which none of you heard. But we are talking right. now about something we were talking about before the show, and that's Faraday Fabrics. And okay. how they could be kind of useful to uh, pretty much anybody to be interested in listening to this. We were yeah. just now talking about building yourself a little Faraday box for your phone. You would buy such a fabric, uh, like you're saying, Craig, from uh, you know any old Chinese brand. Yeah, and uh, you, just you get can, yourself um, a, so a the nice brand box. I have is the brand I have is Nasafe's, which it has. It's funny. It has like the NASA lettering. It has you know their font, and it's definitely not anything to do with NASA. <laughs> Um, but, uh, um, uh, so I, these fabrics are really convenient because you, they're just fabric. Um, like it, it's got metal inside it. It's metalized to actually produce this, uh, this Faraday effect, but, uh, a Faraday cage effect, but it's, it's, uh, um, like the, the stuff that you, you'll find like on Amazon or, or what have you, it's, it's got this metal woven into it that will actually cause the effect. And, but it just looks like fabric. It's you know sometimes they be a little bit stiffer depending on the gauge of wire they used. Uh, let's see, so they have this M M zine or whatever uh, material that they're they've been talking about. So this stuff is, I guess is is effective at blocking signals too. Uh, but if it's if it's uh it's what it looks like, then it's something you can just put on to clothing instead. So okay, it's uh what's yeah, from what I can tell okay, here so it's is flake. okay. Yeah, this yeah, is so something this is, you this could is paint something on coat to... anything with. Yeah, that's that's what this is. This is actually like a, I guess you could call it like a Faraday paint. You could treat. It's a treatment you can put onto clothing. Yeah, well, like you would treat so, uh, like your boots. You know, you would wax yeah. your boots so that they're good against the rain. You would Faraday your clothes so, so they're good against. The downside the is this is dark. This is so you you this looks like after after application this looks like a charcoal gray. So Which, they could definitely get yeah. away with putting this on a suit. Totally. And big. still have it look very nice. Um, so if you have a, like a dark suit, a black suit, or a charcoal gray suit, or a light gray suit, you could put this on there. And I think it would it would just be a different shade of, of gray overall. I, you know, there'd be no reason to not apply it over the whole thing, except my guess is that this shit costs a lot. Well, not only uh, that, you know, this is way more dapper than a tinfoil hat, if we're being honest. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we're taking tinfoil hats to the 21st century here, people. So, so the NASAFE stuff I have looks kind of like a nice light gray or silver. Um, very, very, uh, it looks very, tr- it's very trendy looking. It's very, very well for the aesthetics. But it's kind of limited in that you're, you're not really going to dye the stuff, you know? Uh, it's not going to be something you incorporate into a different coloring scheme. It's yeah. just going to be the way yeah, it all is. All you're going to you know, do, you're going to be behind you're getting to get uh, charcoal and gray versions of whatever color you're going to go with. So you're going to get like super, super dark pastels, basically. Yeah, this stuff is this stuff is is definitely darkening stuff a lot. 
So like I said, a, a black suit, this would be great on it. If you yeah, have a charcoal gray suit. That said too, perfect. like a uh, like a charcoal navy. That might be a really interesting like yeah. uh, like a a dark flat blue. It would definitely give you a darker a darker blue, but I get, I could see this still kind of working. So this stuff is is just I guess it's um like a metallocene uh or whatever basis. There's some sort of uh, that's I that's I'm guessing that that has to be what the M stands for in the M zines. Um but so it's probably a metallocene based linkage for some sort of other conductive material like say nanotubes or or uh or carbon um carbon sheets like graphite or graphene. And on this specific product too, what they're uh, showing here. That makes sense. I mean, it makes, it makes sense that it would be like a graphene that has metallocene linkage in it. Hmm. Yeah, that's Sorry, entirely reasonable, actually. But they're saying with this, they've got uh, what two years of uh, normal storage conditions, only showed a ten percent drop in shielding efficiency. So that's, wow, that's a pretty good for. Now this is storage. This is right. So this here's is the not thing. being worn. This is not being worn. It's also not being dry cleaned. I would see dry cleaning ruining this. Um, if it's if it's uh, if it's adhering to the fibers the way I think it is, I would see dry cleaning stripping this right off. So you'd have to reapply. Yeah, you'd you'd have to reapply have to it again. Some sort of. Uh, and they'd probably sort of charge you a hell of a lot more for it if they knew that you were putting this stuff in intentionally instead of like it was a mess. Uh, you'd probably get charged for them trying to remove a stain, and they'd probably put you know one of those dumbass notes on there saying, "We tried, but we couldn't." Oh yeah, like getting your uh, <laughs> yeah. getting a blued gun back from the uh, place, and it's all shiny and nice. Like oh right, right, thanks. <laughs> yeah, gee, thanks, guys. That's oh, a good you, one. You cleaned it up. It's all bright now. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I so. This would probably be best used in, like, say, the liner to a suitor or a liner to a suitcase or a briefcase. Um, I know. So the yeah, other stuff I was just static, talking about, basically, like, to like we were talking about with the box. Yeah, that would actually be a really so excellent. The box, briefcase. I would say, I would suggest, given the probable cost of this material, that it's probably way cheaper just to get the wire-based stuff. It's 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 just what you need and so if you use that plus conductive um conductive tapes and there's fabric tape versions of the conductive tape by the way um so it was a titan uh titan whatever actually let me just go to my amazon shit and i can just look up the orders here so I look up uh faraday i'm guessing that'll do it okay so emf fabric uh so the faraday fabric is what you look up as so um, I have the NASAFE stuff, and here, let me, let me actually just, this just goes directly to it? Okay, good. Copy link address, bump this into show ideas for you. So here's the NASAFE's fabric, and then Titan RF has Faraday tape, which is what you use to link this stuff together, or you just get, like, copper foil tape. So there's the thin stuff, and then here's the thick boy. And this, uh, there you oh, okay, go. Okay, this is actual just sheeting. Yeah, it's it's just a sheet of fabric, okay. a little sheet of it, and you can stick your phone. You can just take it as is and stick your phone jam in the middle of it, and it works just fine. Okay. You might expect. I but will um, and I, so I actually used yeah. I wow. used a conductive copper tape uh, as a foil lining to a, a candle box I got. Um, so I got, I just got like a box of like fifty or whatever of these uh, those uh, bot profs. And uh, I guess it came from India because it came in this like nice carved wooden box, and I liked it, so I just kept it. Oh, I lined the inside with uh, some some of that copper uh, conductive tape, and then used that as a uh, as a uh, Faraday box. Hmm. So uh, copper tape. Let's find this stuff. Yes, yeah, so the the HX tape. This shit right here. So copy that. So like, there's that one. And then, so it's good to have, there, there's a couple different sizes of this stuff that's good to use. There's those two, and then there's the, the pinstripe pin stuff, the quarter inch stuff. So that you can use to like line the very edges of uh, over the lip of the thing and so on. And so I use those, and then we're This these, is actually like, one props. of those things that's uh, kind of worth doing on your own. It's going to be a fun DIY project, and they're the kind of things that yeah. you uh, want to have in the. Uh, uh, coming days, you could say. Yeah. 
Also, a burner phone. This, box of stuff? this would be a good place yeah, to so keep your burner phone. Burners I've uh, I've played around with in the last uh, several years, uh, just because I'd never, for instance, I just I was just using track phone. Like I'd never bothered. And the great thing with track phone is like they don't give a shit who you sign up as. So my dad, I I used so when we were, my, my little brother and I were younger, we uh, signed up for a bunch of magazines because my dad said, why don't you just get some of these magazines? You know, I'm thinking like Siam and uh, you know, all those good science magazines, Pop Sci, Pop Mechanics, etc. But my dad's like, yeah, here's you know, here's some of these cards from like the the doctor's office or whatever. Let's go ahead and sign up, sign up for them. So because you can just mail them in, we put like ridiculous names on them. I think one of them, I, th I think uh, our name was like Paramecium Biloba. <laughs> so he shows up in the mail, Paramecium Biloba. Uh, and then, so I signed up for track phone. Is that? And I got a text from my dad with a picture of the envelope, and he says, I, I presume this was you. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, here's here's the, the candles I got with the box, so you can see the box it came in. It's a small box. It's uh, it's it's the size. It's, Ooh, it's big enough to put a couple of phones box. in. Oh, a friend of mine had one of these like that. These are really good for storing uh, incense in, too. They just have kind of that yeah. vibe to them. Uh, for the ones yeah, that it, it's don't just bother to look this up, just – uh, you know, just envision a uh, smallish jewelry box that's kind of mm -hmm. longer and a little bit thinner than you would have for jewelry. With a yeah, nice it fits flower and it's like theme there. engraving. Oh, really pretty. I'll put a link to it. Unfortunately, yeah. not an Amazon affiliate link because I'm not that cool yet. But, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, I think you can sign up for Smiles if you want to give to a charity or whatever. And it does it. So the, as far as I understand, it costs nothing to the person who's buying whatever it is you you link to, and they still send the same whatever the percentage is to uh, whatever charity you pick. No, that's cool. And yeah. anyway, even through any of the Amazon affiliate stuff, basically they're just yeah. giving away money to have you become an advertiser. Yeah, they don't actually. Uh, they I, don't I, raise so the my... prices on any of the affiliate link stuff from basically anyone. So I should also say this: this whole that whole smiles thing. <clears throat> my little brother does it. I've been pestered to do it, and I've never done it because I'm just lazy. So, as as a as a a, a, a theoretical kind gesture, it, it exists. But you know, then you have to pick a cherry and whatnot, and so on. Yeah, if you're so inclined, but to it, be a, I, yeah, you know, good and or decent thing. person, etc. If if you trust Amazon to do that shit for you, because as far also, as I know, yes, there's probably you know, not a way are, to get receipts. They are a legitimately evil corporation, so that is the uh, the other issue. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the box I use. That's the foil tape I use. That's the fabric I have on hand. But you uh, could, that's uh, the RF tape. I mean, you can use about anything. Now uh, that said, you, you could you, use aluminum foil too, but you know, copper is better at it. And, and keep in mind, it's attenuation. It's not going to get rid of anything completely. Yeah, it's just kind of a partial solution, which is... No, it, it gets rid of the vast majority of signal. Sure. But it will not get rid of it entirely. So if you're really freaked out about something, your best bet is to just not use a radio frequency product to begin with. Absolutely. But, you know, this is something that's going to work, and it's going to be a safe place to put a uh, a phone you don't yeah. trust a whole lot. So if I was doing, like, meetings behind doors on something sensitive, um, I would probably just turn off the phone, put it in one of these, put it in the freezer or something. You know, it's you can you can get it out of, out of hearing range and so on just doing that. Uh, you're not going to be able to bug someone from one side of one of these uh, boxes. Oh, no, far from it. And and so that the main worry that you really have with these phone with phones these days, by the way, isn't really going to be some like evil uh, evil hacker or whatever or evil spy organization coming after you. It's more more likely going to be the advertising you agreed to allow on your phone by clicking through the click wrap, uh, trying to give you a better product or you know a product that supposedly fits better with uh, your your shopping preferences. You know, that's that's that shit where you, you just say some random word, and I'll just throw one out there. For example, you throw out a word like asparagus, and then you know next week I'm gonna get a fucking ad for it. 
I actually did that exact same thing in the car with my dad, and uh, a week later I got a, f a fucking ad for asparagus, which I hate, by the way. And I made sure to mention that, too. So whatever algorithm they're using to extract information like that is stupid in that it, it's it's dumb to that kind of... It's blind to that kind of nuance. They hear keyword, they send keyword. They don't hear modifiers of keywords. Yeah, that's what, <clears throat> that's what carnivore's for. Yeah. Uh, bomb, you know, terrorism, ammonium nitrate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, you know all those good all those good watch list words. But I'll, uh, yeah, do you know. let's uh, let's bring out the Doxus three thousand and uh, get that shit up and running. Yeah, so car carnivore for those who don't know is uh, an email email sniffing program from back in the eighties and nineties. And uh, that got superseded by several other wonderful programs by the NSA, uh, culminating recently in the uh, the wonderful facility they have over in uh, Utah. Uh, the I love that facility. I love the town next to that facility because the municipality was asked if they could share water resources, as in uh, could the facility contract with the municipal water supply in order to provide cooling for the uh, infrastructure they built in, and the, the town said fuck you. Oh, so they had to. So of course they have the government resources. They just built their own. Uh, they built their own cogen and water supply, so that it, there was nothing they could do about it. But the city isn't supplying shit to them. That's basically what it came down to. Oh, that gives me some hope. Yeah, it, that was a lovely gesture and all. It's just that it didn't actually stop anything. And yeah. then of course everybody got to, this is in the midst of all this stuff coming out uh, about the the mass surveillance that uh, this place was getting built. That was the funniest thing about it was they just this all this news was happening and they went fuck it keep going. Well, you have to remember the administration at the time was a very, a very uh, big on fuck it keep going. With, uh, well, yeah, for the 2012 2014 NDAAs would be a fantastic reference to that. <laughs> you want to indefinitely detain uh, American citizens without trial on U.S. soil? Sure, fuck it, keep going. Yeah, what if yeah, we want to go ahead do, and kill just, American citizens you know, give them a, extrajudicially? Fuck give them keep a, going. Give them a title, give them a label, and then once they've got the uh, the label, then, uh, you know, there they go. Problem solved. No, 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 don't even need to do that. Don't even need to do that at all. If if the president so chooses, and you're on U.S. soil, he can arrest you as a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil and keep you indefinitely detained. That is legal to do. There's no sunset on that provision. <sighs> Lovely, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? Unfortunately, we've, uh, we've some people said that fucking document. Weird position. There's been a lot of powers. Uh, you see, that's away. something that, unfortunately, Trump, as far as I understand, and I haven't looked in too deeply into this, mind you, as far as I understand, this is one of those things that people should have bitched at Trump to get rid of and that he has not gotten rid of. I would love to see that just be executive ordered out of existence. I'd love to see him pull off Obama's fucking bullshit pen and phone policy and just get rid of that. That there's, would make my day. There's a, there's a few things in there that would <clears throat> certainly benefit from a similar yeah, similar use of powers that exist and have been made, you know, and if that's uh, if it doesn't work, then well, that's all the more reason to just go ahead and kill it because it shouldn't be there then, right? So yeah. if one person shouldn't be able to do it, then maybe the other person shouldn't be able to do it either. Yeah, no, I see. That's that's the the frustration there is. As I'd love for him to be able to use that power to go ahead and undo shit, um, but unfortunately, it's supposed to be up to the damn legislature, who, uh, as you've you've seen, is completely fucking ineffectual at compromising on anything useful. Yeah, lots of now. Admittedly, I'd love for them to never pass another law if that meant that we didn't have to deal with all the shit that usually comes along with it. But unfortunately, we do need budgets to be passed, and we do need the government to continue rolling along for a little while. You know, until it completely collapses the economy with its fucking debt. Well, not just the government. I mean, you've got uh, <clears throat> the World Economic Forum telling us that, you know, we don't really need to have our property or money anyway. So. Oh, I, I love that one. You're not going to have, you're going to own shit, and you're going to be happy. Fuck you. You're going <laughs> to eat those bugs, Greg. You're going to eat the bugs. Fuck and you're going to sleep too. in your cube, and you're going to pay money every month for your lovely little I'm going to find out wherever piece of land I can own, and I'm going to fucking build my own little fortress on it. Fuck that shit. 
He's right, though. You know, that's uh, if you're out there listening, that's what you need to do. Get yourself a piece of property. If all you can do is get some shitty little trailer or camper to park out on it, man, at least you own that land. That's yours. Yeah, that's now you might you're gonna have to pay your tax rent, but you know, depending on which state you're in, you're gonna have better luck than with that than others. Uh, you know, yeah, I basically I would red. avoid California. Yeah, at avoid all. California with, at all costs. Actually, you know, just avoid the West Coast. Basically, everything up that area is kind of uh, that's the thing. Fucked. Washington State has good laws in that regard. Seattle is just a shithole. Oh yeah, no, Seattle should. Now, what would happen is people would actually go up Not there and be. live tax free by going to like to to whatever the hell is it, like Oregon, some Oregon university that's just over the border. Was it was it Steve that was telling us about this, or maybe it was uh, maybe it was my brother telling me about it? Yeah, I'm not familiar. But it's basically tax free because in Portland they didn't have sales tax in this area, and in Washington there's no property tax. Hmm. Well, and there's no income tax. That's a good so, trick. or or the inc- whatever it's it's there's no state income tax, does it? Uh, and and so basically you just you know you rent your student housing. But you pay no, inc- you know, no tax on your income, and you go across the border to university and buy all your shit over there because there's no, there's no uh, uh, sales tax. Mm, that's a good grift. Yeah, that's true. And also, you know, it's uh, I mean, aside from being a legitimately good grift, that's college students got a lot to deal with. So if you are trying yeah. to go to college and you don't mind being in one of the most paused places on the face of the earth. That's the downside, isn't it? <laughs> you're you're at the north end of that of that shitty coast where all the bad ideas float up to. <laughs> exactly that, sir. Exactly that. Oh, it's terrible. It is how the uh, you you could truly say how the mighty have fallen. Eh, I mean, yeah, I guess. The only thing I was really holding that whole area up there together was the fact that Amazon was happy to be there, and now they've already gone ahead and fucked that up. As they are wont to do. And then, of course, all the, there's uh, all the uh, businesses that are now heading over to Texas. Yeah, uh, to get, what is it? Get HP's the already left? Uh, there's a couple other big names. Uh, I, that is, that is the, the funniest thing. They're all getting out of there because California is a shithole, and they finally have the opportunity and I was just saying on Twitter the other day, I or uh, was yesterday, the other day, uh, I uh, if I had like if it was within the cost of the taxes I had to pay in California for like the next year or two to to jump ship, there's no financial reason to stay. Everything's everything at that point would say leave. Oh yeah, you're you're being uh, they're they're warning you guys. They're warning you. You're on the west coast and you catch this. You need to get uh, here's, out. Here's another thing. Here's another thing about this uh, about what's going on over there on the on the uh, on the fucking um, ballot this year. They are trying to pass a measure out there, or, or it's not on the ballot. It was the thing that was going through their their state legislature. Whatever it is, there's a a wealth tax that they're trying to implement. I think it's up to four up to four and change percent if you have like over fifty million dollars. So obviously not going to be the general purpose audience, but if you have over a certain threshold if you busted your ass and saved to get there not only do they want to impose the wealth tax and that's not an income tax that's a tax on your holdings and it's not specified how that would be implemented if it would be just dollars or dollar value so and keep in mind like silicon valley area is some high high price property they want to impose a wealth tax as high as it gets they want to they want to impose a wealth tax, but they also want to impose to prevent the flight of business and flight of wealth a ten year backlog on it. They want to make it retroactive, or a ten year it's, it's either retroactive or a ten year lag. Either way, it's unconstitutional. But you know that has that requires you to have standing from suffered damages in order to go through the courts. So you already have to be fucked by this at least the once in order for you to be able to sue California and get it declared unconstitutional. So they, they, but they want to impose a wealth tax. It's like there is, if you have money, or you're going to make money, or you have a business, no fucking reason to stay there. Not at all. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> on that very note, 
Uh, I yeah. believe it was five. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, five or six days ago, uh, Los Angeles County got a new district attorney, uh, George yeah. Gascon, and uh, he's had some interesting uh, things to to put out there. You you could say um, it's it's going to be interesting in L.A. So let well, me see LA, if I can find the big list because there's quite oh, a lot man. here. Uh, LA is totally fucked as it is. Oh, completely. You know, they don't want to stay home. They want to go out and uh, and spread the disease. So now they have another lockdown because the people who run the place are going to go with that route of uh, of uh, damage control uh, instead of having instead of like saying to the adults there, "Hey, act like adults." By the way, here's a way to supply masks and soap and shit behave like adults instead they're saying you should all stay home you're all children over and you more. need to listen to what i am telling you yeah so. that's that's so not the way to do it though there's the the, the ha giving people the responsibility and then informing them directly by the way if you get sick from this and you done goofed that's on you like that's the way you do. It. So I mean, we have helmet laws, which are, I think are still a little bit stupid, but they exist. They came around when I was growing up. We have click it or ticket in Florida now, which is stupid. That came around when I was growing up. I mean, all that is is uh, another reason for a cop to give you a ticket. Uh, it, it just it just adds insult to injury when you get pulled over. At this point, everybody who was going to wear a seatbelt was already wearing it. I right, George just uh, As for let me get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, trying to get the uh, the major link here. Okay, so let me go over this. They're no longer going to be seeking cash bail for any misdemeanor or non-violent, non-serious felony offense. Holy shit, really? Yeah. Attorneys who have clients currently behind bars awaiting trial on any of the affected offenses can immediately schedule a hearing to revisit bail on the offense. Yeah, let's let all the fuckers out of prison. And uh, and then we'll bitch at you about uh, about plastic straws and shit. And that's there number one. Number two, he has pledged to immediately end the practice of charging minors as adults and will make victim services available to families of those shot and killed by law enforcement officers. Well, I mean, that's kind of nice, but... Yeah, the last part is okay, but the former part, if yeah. you're a 16-year-old who's a member of a fucking gang and you go out and shoot someone up, fuck you, you should be tried as an adult. There's limits to that kind of piece, you know? Like, if you're a kid and you go and do grand grand theft, like, yeah, maybe you fell in with the wrong crowd. But as soon as you pull a trigger on another human, come on. And he has also ordered all... Oh, oh there's more. There's more, of course. This He's also great. ordered L.A. County prosecutors to stop prosecuting first-time offenders accused of nonviolent crimes. A wide variety of nonviolent crimes. I mean, I'm sure there's some, oh, there, but considering there probably aren't. Including this is, this is criminal the area where nine hundred dollars is a cutoff, right? Oh yeah, this is above and beyond all that. Yeah. So criminal trespass, awesome. disturbing the peace, public intoxication. Okay, that one is kind of that one's okay. Loitering. Eh, I, that one. Uh, okay. Yeah, public but, intoxication already has so much largesse, though. So much. If you get absolutely. if you get caught in public intoxication, like you have to have already been a dick. You have to have already been a dick, man. Yeah, kind of. I, 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 there's, there, there are absolutely cases where, where it's true, where the guy just like you, you should have cut him a break. But the vast majority of the times where you get public intoxication as a fucking minor, or just like as a first time offense, you've been a dick. Yeah, probably. Now, some of it, some of it is bullshit, but you know, there's, there's always a little something there. Yeah. Now that said, L.A. It's kind of bullshit, but L.A. doesn't really uh, prosecute yeah. anything that they should, so... But also, okay. one more thing. They're going to be reviewing uh, thousands of cases in which uh, L.A. County citizens were sentenced under enhancement rules. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, oh, you used a gun in that crime. Well, maybe that's fine. You know, you didn't actually kill him. You just threatened him. It's... It's it's we're all good. Maybe we'll just go let you out or cut you back a little bit because yeah, you, know, you didn't you didn't stab him. You know, you only threatened him right. with a knife. <sighs> what uh, what curious times in which we find ourselves, eh? <laughs> Fuck sake, man, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> God uh, damn L.A. It. is uh, L.A. is a place I would like to never go. 
I might though if we get uh, national reciprocity. But if uh, if things <laughs> progress at their current uh, trajectory, that's a pretty unlikely thing. And yeah, the, uh, the potential next administration would be very averse to expanding any civil rights to anyone, and probably pretty keen on uh, clamping down on them with uh, a fist made primarily of iron or stone. But who am I to say? Right. I'm I'm, uh, I'm not a politician. I just uh, I just don't like them because. <laughs> I, mean, do, I just think they're all cancer. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. They have uh, done much to make our world worse, and they are really, really good at it. Oh yeah, I'll have to. Uh, I'll include a link to the LA Times for this, by the way, if anybody actually wants to read up mm -hmm. on this further, since they have a pretty good write up on what's happened with the new uh, DA. It's going to be. Well, uh, I don't know if any of uh, you good people, or Craig, I'm sure you have, have seen uh, that documentary about uh, a man by the name of Mr. Pliskin who had to leave Los Angeles and, uh, <laughs> you know, the endeavors that he had to go through to get out. It's, uh, right. It is a riveting story, a uh, true story. It takes place right about now. And, uh, you know, you should watch it. It'll give you some ideas on uh, your day-to-day -day survival skills and tactics that you might want to employ. Now, I think I had some other things that I wanted to go over, but I mean, those were those were pretty good to just spring on you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were going to talk about how it's finally, like, official that mm -hmm. uh, COVID and the, uh, well, the hospitals get paid more for coronavirus coded patients. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and here, actually, this, two things. And the first thing I should do is, is because this is kind of the point of it, to make it really clear. Yes, they get a bump for having a bed occupied by a COVID patient. That is a true thing that happens. This happens for other kinds of patients as well, but this is a thing. Yeah, well, that's that said, across the board. They spend are... a lot of resources <laughs> on this. They are not getting a. They're not getting like some kickback out of this that is going to be uh, budget defining. It's it's well, a we drop talked in the about this here. previously. I mean, there were budget uh, shortfalls, which were caused by these lockdowns so, and everything else. So other um, other people I know uh, are in charge of certain things like this, and uh, one hospital network I know of um, had a lot of budget stresses earlier uh, because people in charge knew that the budget shortfalls were coming. And so they did prudent action to um, to cry and, and avoid. This. And this is going to be coming uh, before the vaccine arrived. This is there was kind of prior knowledge that this stress was going to come. So a lot of places kind of hunkered down. So when we talk about them getting money for these beds, hospitals get a public hospital gets money for a bed anyway when it's filled by a patient. So this is one of the reasons why they keep the surge capacity, generally speaking, so low. Uh, you know, they, they have like 90% occupancy typically. Um, it's because the more beds you have occupied, the more the state pays for the budget. So if someone comes in and they, so they basically, they, the public hospitals want people to come to them when they have a problem. So, you know, they'll, the, the patient gets charged a certain amount and usually it's via an insurance company that it gets paid. Um, but they also, if if someone shows up and goes to the ED, gives a false name, and then leaves and never pays, the state picks up the slack on that. So if you're ever wondering how that cost is covered, it comes out of your tax dollars. Period. That's always been the way it worked. As do so many things. People forget that uh, money doesn't just come from nowhere. It right. Comes from you. Yeah. So anybody. So whenever someone says something stupid, for instance, and and it's not knocking on because they need healthcare too to a degree. You know, it's it's it is it is a public service that I can almost be okay with if they got shipped back where the fuck they came from. When an illegal alien shows up at an ED and needs help, they get helped. But that money comes out of tax dollars, and, and that that's where the shortfall comes from, or from the other people who show up to the hospital and do pay. So whenever someone says that they don't get those services, they're flat out fucking lying. 
Yeah. Like th just just tell him to to eat a chode because that is a complete fucking lie. Yeah, the hospitals are they will take care of you. Period. Yeah. The you know the intake triage is going to do a certain amount of of naysaying and nagging, but after that, you know, if you have a fake name, etc., and you say you don't have insurance, which is what's usually done uh, in these situations, you get taken care of. Yeah, I mean that's that's just kind of how it is in a lot yeah. of places, and, and like I said, I'm okay with someone being taken for care of in in the normal operating costs of any given hospital. Yeah. And, and again, oh, I'm okay stuff. with I'm okay with someone being taken care of in an emergency situation like that. Uh, what I'm not okay with is paying for a life of fucking emergency care or health care that way. Yeah, absolutely. So like, if someone is not in a one-off situation, like they get in a car car accident or they fall off a ladder, or shit like that, shit happens. Take care of them, but then they should go home. You know, home if home is not here, then they should go home. But again, you know, that's I also don't want someone to like. Go and die in a corner because they can't get to healthcare without getting deported. That'd also kind of be shit. So there, there's there's a uh, there's room for finesse there. Anyway, go back yeah, to the COVID shit. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we did the. I don't know. That's uh, that that was, that was entirely my fault to actually get on to considering because there's a there's a real discussion to be made about the whole healthcare yeah. and the cost related to it and how yeah it and, here and nuance is important also. here. So in the in the same vein with nuance, um, a hospital bed occupied by a COVID patient, you're expending significant resources on that patient. Uh, you're not just going to bring someone in uh, and keep them in a bed because they have COVID and get money out of it. There's enough people who are actually legitimately sick from this thing, and there's been enough beds divested kind of from hospitals, uh, getting rid of people who come in for routine but non non critical stuff. Um, there's been enough of an increase in surge capacity that has been just outright consumed by the surge in COVID patients. Uh, we're actually getting close to the point where we have to be worried about people getting sick from this shit because we're going to run out of beds. When you run out of beds, it's not just COVID patients who are screwed. It's fucking everybody. Um, yeah, so a COVID bed have to go is... in for surgery and, you know, people have yeah. issues and everything. How about, you know, say the car accident or the falling off the ladder shit happens and you have to go to the hospital. If it, all the beds are taken... From COVID patients, you're not going to get a bed. Yeah, Triage is going to come into play there. Getting and, COVID on top. Yeah, there's that too. You might also guarantee you get sick with it going in. So, so that being said, so, avoid the hospital if you don't need to go. So right now we're we're um, we're above 85 percent capacity in the U.S. Um, that, that means that's an average. There are localities already that have consumed all their all their ICU beds. Gone. That's really bad. Yeah, it's actually, really, now really, that really is bad. one thing that I will say has been done in California that does not seem stupid and actually does seem somewhat intuitive, where they've tied their uh, lockdown status, which is kind of bullshit, but I mean, if you're going to do it, at least apply some sort of sense to it. But they've tied right. it to their ICU capacity, which is one of the only sensible things I have heard out of that health state. Yeah, and uh, the problem is that that has a lag period to it that is going to not save them from having... The from exceeding capacity. It's just, that's the problem with it, is that it does not prevent overcapacity from happening, because it's not a low enough percentage. No, no, it's, and, and it's again, a band-aid. It, it shouldn't, like, if you use, if you went to a low enough percentage, then you'd be stuck in lockdown for a long-ass time. Um, it just, it is not reasonable to do it that way. So that's the part where it's still bullshit. But if you're going to tie it to something, that is, that is a sensible metric. Yeah, I mean, at least they're, well, it, as you say, it's sensible and isn't necessarily the best response, but right. you know, it's the it's one of the best things we've seen out of California. It's an obvious it's, it's an obvious metric to go to, and you can tell that that was made by healthcare professionals trying to suggest something that rather than just some guy in a suit at a podium who later goes on to dine at a restaurant without a mask. Right, that fucker. I think that kind of shit right there is recall worthy. I think his ass should be out of office right now. Oh, there's any number of uh, governors that absolutely deserve the boot after they're completely. Dude, that guy in Denver here. is like. At least he had the balls to go on to Twitter and say I'm sorry. That fucker in Denver, though. Just I did it as a father. Fuck you, man. Or uh, what? The, the one guy that was tweeting from the airport uh, that you shouldn't travel as he's you know leaving. That was the guy. Same oh, guy. Oh, him. Oh. Yeah. 
That was oh, a Denver. That was a Denver. Uh, the Denver guy, and uh, and he 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 said when uh, when he went and he flew down to do that, uh, he did that as a father, not as a not as a uh, whatever. And it's like you just eat yeah, shit. It, and it die. doesn't work that way, asshole. Yeah, it's just you you and I. I went off on that guy. I don't. I'm sure he didn't read shit of anything I said, but like I was, I was fucking mad. Like just don't travel. I'm traveling. Fuck you. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, as they say, uh, at least that was nonpartisan when he did it, as opposed to someone like Shitmer up there in uh, in Michigan. Mm, absolutely. You know, yeah. This He's, specific uh... area of the state can't go and do anything, while I'm going to go to that specific area of the state to enjoy my lakeside shit. Fuck you. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the crypt keeper, uh, that lady from Chicago, yeah, uh, did something similar as well. She, it's funny. She looks so much like, uh, like that woman down in, in, uh, in, I uh, was it, uh, Broward, um, uh, Cheetlejuice. She looks so much like her. Uh, just, just the, the, that fucking expression on the face. Death's knocking and I can't wait. Yeah, they, we, we have some very ghoulish individuals in positions of power these days. It's a little disconcerting. <laughs> Well, I mean, we we end up electing these people who've been around for forever because they've been around for forever. I I would love to see term like this is the reason why a constitutional convention has not been called in by uh by any mechanism that legislature can afford. They don't want a constitutional convention because the rest of the country wants their asses out of office by term limits. And oh, they absolutely. don't want term limits. They want to be able to stay in power and increase their uh, their their influence in areas. They want to have that access to everything that allows them to do shit like insider trading, but on a country size scale, not company size. You know that that bitch from uh, was it uh, Loeffler in Georgia, the one who uh, who cashed out in February. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, like she doesn't deserve to win. Somebody else should have been in her seat. Yeah. You know what? That's uh that's an interesting conversation too. In Georgia, you know, my look. My way of looking at this situation is it's worth your while to go ahead and vote. If you're one of those people that's thinking that uh, why why participate in a broken system, because the system still exists and you exist yeah. inside of it. So there is no reason not to try every legal avenue available to you until there are no more legal avenues available to you. And exactly. then things get more complicated. Keep in mind that when the country went to war – with England to for independence, a third of the country was what caused that. A third of the country didn't want war actively, loyalists. A third of the country just didn't want fighting. They 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 were pissed off, but they said we can't go to war. We need to protect our homes. So everybody that that was the and end result of that doing whole all total, the avenues. Only three percent fought. That was the end result of pursuing all legal avenues. But that and being so, said, three percent of seventy-five million is approximately two and a half million. That's a large number. I'm just putting that's that out there. That's way more than fought in the uh, in the Independence War, definitely. And now, now this is going. This is just official numbers. If the if the true numbers are higher, who knows? Okay, who's to say? I gotta push back. I gotta push back right here because this is bullshit. Every single time, let's we'll call it seventy-five million, because every goddamn time the number comes up, it gets larger. I was laughing my ass off a couple days ago when someone said ninety million. It's like, look, dude, bullshit. I, 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 I like I mentioned, I mentioned eighty million to someone not that long ago, and they said, "Are you sure it's eighty million?" Because I only saw like seventy odd, and you know the official number at the time was like 72 and it was 80 because someone said 80 it's like yeah i it's whatever it's the number i saw and every time i see a new number it goes up a little bit because these people are pissed off that they lost by the by the system as it was at the time so it doesn't matter if you think that trump won according to the system right now he's probably lost he hasn't actually lost until at least january 6th Oh yeah, and I think he's actually only lost one case, as a matter of fact, too. Well, so he, at the when Giuliani was uh, 
was specifying that stuff in, in whichever of those hearings it was, they only put forward three cases and only had one rejected. Two were either in pro two were in process. Yeah. Because so... that one that one little sniveling shit on the panel tried to say that they like lost thirty odd k or whatever it is. And he's <laughs> he's like, I want him I I want I want uh what was it? I want him punished. It's like shut up, Giuliani. Oh, there's there's I a lot of that specifically off. going around right now. Like, uh, we've got to we've got to take these people off of the Congress. We've got to get them for sedition. We're at a we're at a very complicated yeah. political place right now. And well, there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of uh, people who are trying to um, who are trying to put their personal politics into the context of some form of nationalist jingoism, and it's just it's so transparent that they're just they're just pissed off that their pet their pet thing didn't go the way they wanted it to. And and look, I want Trump to win. I, it would be so great if you if he won. We're probably going to end up with Biden at this point, and we're just going to have to learn to live with that. And, that, and, and I'm not Biden. saying to give up. I, I what I really want to see is the Twelfth Amendment process kick off and go the full route. I want to see like you know we're still having the House do uh, votes trying to get a two thirds majority of states like in the middle of fucking july that would make my day oh yeah uh, the longer this goes on the better i because, mean because quite true. frankly at this point it's it's now an act of comedy to me uh this is the, the way that they got the votes the way the way they did with this the electronic voting all this shit it's just so comically bullshit to me that like we we, we have to have this play out as as uh, ridiculously as possible true i don't like, now it is personal entertainment for me and the thing about this is to where uh, where I said earlier, you know, you really do need to exhaust all your legal uh, legally available opportunities because if you don't, then you're kind of being a dick for one. Yeah. And for two, you're kicking things off before it's time to kick them off, as uh, as you might put it. Yeah, you're uh, you're premature there. Yeah, because uh, well, the good guys do all the uh, you do all the right things first. Yeah. Check your list off. Don't, Absolutely. Uh... Don't crumple it halfway through. Right, right. You don't have to quit the game until the game's actually over. You know, we're still turning over cards, you might say. Well, so the fu funny thing is here, we actually do have a fat lady, and she hasn't sang yet. Um, so what we really need to do is uh, is get that gap tooth cunt from Georgia to sit in front of Congress and, and rat other people out. Then the fat lady is finally sung, and uh, you can call it quits. Yeah, there. Well, actually, she's not even the only one. There's a number of a uh, number of large <laughs> ladies that could do a lot of singing there's about. There's a number of uh, corpulent happy. birds, are there? Indeed, sir. There truly are. And you know what? I think we have just about hit on an absolutely perfect spot to just call it for the week because <laughs> there's so much that's going to be coming up that it'll probably be worth discussing on this specific issue over the next. Week. Fatally, fatally, uh, fatally fat pheasantry. Mm. That's the end of our discussion. Glorious. <laughs> all right, folks. Thanks for being here. We will catch you all again uh, oh, next week. Hopefully, I'll have Craig back. Right. Hopefully, I'll have Steve. Who knows what'll happen? And uh, so, stay uh, safe. Family. Keep your powder dry. Yeah.